We have an unfortunate habit of underestimating the capabilities of the people who came before us. Some people even judge their grandparents for not being able to operate computers or smartphones properly. So imagine what they think of people who lived thousands of years ago. This lack of faith in our forefathers is unfair to them, and we'll prove it with the content of this video. The Koreans were so proud of the invention of the Geobuxion that they kept using it for 400 years. If the name means nothing to you, you might know it better as the Turtle Ship. These enormous warships entered service with the Korean Navy in the 15th century and remained in service until the 19th century. The Turtle Ship nickname comes from the shell-like coverings that the vessels had, which helped with their main task of defensing Korea from invading ships of the Japanese Navy. Some historians believe the Geobuxion to be the first armored ship in human history. The defining moment in the vessel's history came during the Japanese invasion of Korea between 1592 and 1598, during which the turtle ships under the command of Admiral Yi Sun Sin had a 100% success rate against the Japanese. By the 18th century, at least one iron-plated turtle ship had been built with hexagonal armor plating. It can be seen in a 1795 drawing found by the British historian Stephen Turnbull. But the final fate of the ship is unknown. Several full-size turtle ships still exist in museums today, including one that's anchored at Tiosu. Here's another incredible piece of technology from ancient Korea. It's Gyeongju Seok Bingo, and while it might look like a burial mound, it's actually a refrigerator. The facility can be found, appropriately enough, in Jiangju, where it's set into a corner of Wolseong Fortress. The name Seok Bingo, when translated into English, means stone ice storage. It's an accurate description of the structure, which is an ice box made of stone. Visitors to Korea during the 1700s often wrote of their astonishment that the hosts were able to produce ice during the middle of summer. This was their secret and it's not even an especially complicated one. Inside Gyeongju Seok Bingo, which certainly wouldn't have been the only facility of its kind, is a storage room where blocks of ice cut from lakes were placed during the winter. The conditions inside the structure kept the water frozen so the ice there was to use in summer. The system works because half of the structure is underground, making it immune to changes in the air temperature above the ground outside. The burial mound structure on top of it is there purely to keep air out of the chamber. If you ever came across a thunder crash bomb, you'd certainly know about it. This device is exactly what it sounds like. It's a weapon, and you can probably guess what kind of weapon it is. The Chinese invention, which is also known as the Heaven Shaking Thunder Bomb, is believed to be the first bomb or hand grenade invented following on from the invention of gunpowder. You could argue that Greek fire was a form of grenade, but Greek fire didn't explode like thunder crash bombs did. The weapons were developed during the Song Dynasty era of the 12th century. The shell of each device was cast iron, which was then filled with gunpowder and attached to a fuse. It was a crude device as far as explosives go, but it was effective. Some historical sources suggest that explosive devices existed before the thunder crash bomb, but they all had soft casings rather than the hard iron of the 12th century invention. Thunder crash bombs were more deadly because of the potential for shrapnel damage from the exploding casings, and they also terrified the enemies of the Song Dynasty because of the enormous bang and flash they created when they blew up. Your first thought upon seeing the giant Norias of Hama is probably that they're enormous Ferris wheels. That would be wrong. They also look a little bit like the type of watermill wheels that were popular during the 16th century. That's a little closer to the truth because they are water wheels, but they're much older than that. These impressive structures weren't built 400 years ago. Their true age is much closer to 2,500 years. You'll find them in Hama in Syria, where 17 of them are still standing today. 
It's thought that there were once several more of them, but major conflicts in the area over the passing centuries have destroyed a few. Our estimate of their age comes from the first recorded appearance in historical context, which is a mosaic created in the city of Apamea in 469 BCE. This invention meant that the people of ancient Syria were using an advanced irrigation system to bring safe drinking water into Hamad during a time when many people in other parts of the world were still cupping water into their hands out of streams or rivers to drink it. Sadly, history has forgotten the name of the person responsible for their design. Our next piece of old technology is more whimsical than revolutionary, and it's more antique than ancient. But we're including it anyway because it's fascinating. It's a radio hat, and it was invented in 1931. The idea behind it was a simple one. People wanted to listen to the radio while commuting, and this hat would make it possible. In real terms, it's an evolutionary step on the path towards the invention of headphones. The radio hat isn't the prettiest garment you'll ever see. It's a large straw hat with two antennas poking out of it, but it worked. The name of the inventor has been lost to time, but it appeared in a British magazine called Pathetone Weekly, in an article which claims that it was invented in Berlin, where the hats were already popular with commuters, as well as people who play golf or work outdoors. There's no evidence that any such invention was ever popular in Berlin or even that the radio hat had German origins. So whoever wrote the article may have been lying about its popularity in Berlin in the hope that it would catch on in London. We tend to think of the automobile as either a late 19th or early 20th century invention popularized by Henry Ford. As is so often the case, our suppositions are wrong. The first vehicle we today recognize as a car was invented by Ferdinand Verbeist, who was born in Belgium in 1623, but spent most of his life living as a Flemish Jesuit missionary in China. Verbiest was a skilled astronomer and mathematician, as well as being a translator, cartographer, and diplomat. Clearly, he was a very intelligent, accomplished man. In 1672, he presented the Kanchi Emperor with a device he called the Steam-Propelled Trolley. Schematics for the vehicle can be found in his manuscript Astronomia Europea, which he finished in 1681. In the manuscript, Verbiest uses the Latin word motor to describe the vehicle and claims that a single filling of coal is sufficient to keep it moving for around one hour. The version that Verbius gave to the Emperor was a scale model, so we don't know if he ever went on to make a full-size version capable of carrying people or cargo. But even if he didn't, it's still the first self-propelled vehicle in history. If we asked you to think of a suit of armor, you'd probably think of a knight riding a horse in a clanking suit of metal. You almost certainly wouldn't think of anything that looks like the Kiribati armor. Armor like this, and so much as it can even be called armor, is exclusive to the independent Republic of Kiribati in the Pacific Ocean. It's made from woven coconut fibers, which hold the remains of aquatic animals in place so as to afford the wearer a basic degree of protection. Historians think that Kiribati was first founded around 5,000 years ago. Its people are known for their seafaring abilities and their habit of building large communal buildings called Meneba. It's difficult for experts to pin down the historical provenance of the armor because the people had no written language. What's known of their history comes from an oral tradition that was suppressed for centuries by European colonists. Some of those oral traditions say that the armor was worn for ritual one-on-one -on -one combat to settle disputes over territory and resources during which the participants would take turns to wound each other. It sounds brutal. Human-powered flight is an invention of the 20th century, or at least that's what we've always been taught to believe. It appears that the truth might be far harder to swallow. Welcome to the concept of Vimanas, ancient Indian chariots that allegedly rose into the sky, spewing fire and water as they went. 
It would be easy to write them off as an ancient hoax if references to them didn't appear in so many texts written independently of each other. They're mentioned by name in both Hindi and Sanskrit texts that date back 3,500 years. The most detailed description of them comes from the Veda, which says the interior of the flying vessels contained 12 pillars, a wheel, a control panel, and 300 articulated pivot points. Another text known as the Ramayana explains that ownership of Vimanas was limited to the ruling class, which is corroborated by the Mahabharata texts. There's no direct evidence that one single Vimana ever existed. But why did so many ancient writers speak of them like they'd seen them with their own eyes if that's the case? Many people are obsessed with buying branded goods these days, but branding and marketing appear to go back much further than most people imagine. We know that because it seems that at one point, a little over a thousand years ago, every warrior worth his salt in Europe wanted an Ulfbert sword like this one. They've been found all over the continent, and experts believe they probably started out as a Viking trend, although that can't be proven. As far as we know, they were the first swords ever to be made from casts, with iron melted together with carbon and then poured into a mold. That process did away with the impurities that weakened many of the blades of the era and gave the warriors who owned them an advantage in combat. Nobody else in Europe appears to have been able to replicate the process for at least 200 years. So the question of how the Vikings came up with the idea is unknown. It might have been stolen from an Asian tribe they conquered, but that's really little more than a best guess. There are as many names for this next object as there are theories about its origin. Most people just call it the Sabu Disk. But we've also seen it called the Schist Dist and the Saqqara Disc, the latter name being given because it was found in Egypt's North Saqqara in 1936. It looks a lot like a steering wheel, so alien conspiracy theorists like to imagine that it was a control device for an ancient spaceship. Scientists are quick to call that idea ridiculous, but they struggle to come up with a better explanation for how a wheel-shaped object could have turned up in Egypt 5,000 years ago, during a time before Egyptians had even invented the wheel. The soft rock that the artifact is made from would break under the slightest pressure if it were put in the wrong place, and it's only one inch thick in places. If it was supposed to be a sculpture, it was made out of the least suitable material for the job. Some people think it might be an ornate candlestick holder, but if so, why haven't we found anything else that looks like it in all the years we've been excavating Egyptian tombs? Seen from above, this incredible invention in Ghanabad, Iran looks like nothing more significant than a series of puckered holes in the ground. That's misleading. This is actually one huge interconnected structure known as Kiaris and it's an ancient miracle of hydraulic engineering. It's one of the greatest surviving examples of an irrigation system known as Quanit, a form of water transportation technology that's still in use in some parts of the world today. Faced with life on a dry plain 3,000 years ago, the ancient Persians knew that the only way to survive was to make water come to them, and that's what the Kiaris does. This system is made up of underground tunnels that run on for miles, connecting wells to underground reservoirs. The holes visible from above provide ventilation to the tunnels and also provide access for water collecting. Building just one average-sized quantit would take many years, as all the work was done with picks and shovels. Building something the size of Kiaris must have taken decades. Systems like this still exist in Libya, Turkmenistan, Iran, and Afghanistan. The steam train was invented in the United Kingdom. Trains are still a vital transport link within the country today, but these days they're almost all powered by electricity. The evolution of trains didn't go directly from steam to electricity, though. There were a few experimental train types trialed between the two eras including the Crystal Palace Pneumatic Railway. This was an atmospheric railway, one that made use of air pressure differentials to propel railway carriages down the track, and it was designed by Thomas Webster Rammel. 
The design bore some similarities to the proposed Hyperloop systems of today. Train capsules would be sucked down airtight tunnels at high speeds, encountering limited friction along the way. He successfully operated the line for a little over two months and almost saw his idea enter mass production with a second line plan between London's Waterloo and Whitehall, but the project was called off before it could be finished. Nobody seems to know why the idea wasn't taken any further, but if the Hyperloop is ever a success, part of the credit should be given to Rammel. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.